so when when we're dealing with somebody who's who's experienced sexual violence, rather than coming up with some profound way that they will move past this in the next six months or whatever, simply saying, I'm so sorry, and, and this wasn't your fault. Like, that can go so much further. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the newest chapter of the Let's Give a Damn podcast, chapter 37. I'm so thrilled you're here. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining us. Before I introduce today's guest, which I'm very excited about, it was one of the harder episodes to record, one of the harder stories to hear and really process through, but it's a necessary one. And so I'm very excited to introduce today's guest. But before that, some exciting news. On the 10th of November, it was our one year anniversary. Cue all of the clapping, cue all of the cheering. At least that's what I felt like doing the other day and still today. This has been an exciting year. We've experimented with a lot of things. I've met some of the most incredible people ever. I've been privileged to share some of those stories with you and with so many other people. So thank you. Thank you for joining me. If you are not here listening. I guess I could be making this podcast for no one and just putting it out there, but it makes it so much better that you have decided to join the Let's Give a Damn family, listening to these stories, processing through them, being inspired by them, and then going and giving a damn, going and doing something. So it's been an exciting year. I'm so excited about what we've accomplished in a year, and I'm extra excited about what is yet to come the amazing things that we're going to do yeah happy anniversary let's give a damn thank you for joining me for this adventure for this journey today's guest jamie cyrus you're going to get more of a picture of why this was a hard conversation to have jamie experienced pretty severe sexual abuse growing up i'm not going to leave it at that because the story just on there's so much more to the story so i'm not giving it away but He experienced sexual abuse and what I love about Jamie and why we connected and why I really want to get the stories about there is what he did with that. Um, And it's really timely in the worst kind of way, but very timely that we're sharing this story because of so many sexual abuse victims speaking out against their oppressors today, starting with Harvey Weinstein a few weeks ago and so many more have come out, Kevin Spacey's abusees the people that he abused and so many others are now coming out with Roy Moore. Yeah, just so many others. It's been a very difficult week or two, right? But I'm very thrilled to know Jamie. I'm very thrilled to know what he's doing with The Voice for the Innocent. And I want you to hear his story. I want you to really just like sit in it for a minute and just feel the pain and then use what you feel from Jamie's story and what he's doing and the work that he's doing to go out and help others, to go out and be one of those that believes the victims when they do speak up, and to go out there and seek those people out and be there to help them. Yeah, lots to learn from Jamie, an amazing man. So let's get right into it. I'm going to be quiet now. I'm excited for you to hear this story. Here's chapter 37 of Let's Give a Damn podcast with Jamie Sivers. Here we go. So for those just tuning in here, Jamie and I got on the call two or three weeks ago to record this podcast interview. We got about 40 minutes in. We were we were winding down and my laptop just shut off. It just gave up. My battery had been going for quite some time and it just stopped. And we tried to recover the audio, no go. So not only did it has it taken us seven months or so to get get on a call together when we finally did, I screwed it up or my laptop did, but thanks Apple. But um, but here we are. We're finally here. Welcome to the podcast, Jamie. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. And uh, how are you? I'm great. So let's get right into this. I'm so excited to talk with you. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, fortunately and unfortunately, I know a little bit about this because we've already gone 40 minutes and then lost it all. Right. <laughs> but I left our conversation so stoked and moved by the things that you've been through and 
in what you've been able to accomplish and what you're building. So I'm actually doubly, again, in a, in a weird way, I'm doubly excited that I get to go through this again and get to finally get this story out to the Let's Give a Damn family. So thank you so much for being here. And let's start with your story. So go back as far as you want to. I, I'm looking for the people, the places, the things, situations, good, bad, ugly, the things that made you who you are today, which will lead up to some of the things you're doing and how all that happened. But take me back as far as you want to go to give us a context for who made the Jamie we're listening to today. Yeah, thank you for the the kind uh, comments, by the way. I, I really am excited to be here. I like what you're doing. And I think that we, we, we hear enough negative stories, so it's really good to hear about people that are working in different corners of the world. I was raised by a single mother, and I was her only child. So for the whole first part of my life, it was just me and her, and um, we would pretty much do everything together. I remember uh, you know, she bought me a, a t-ball set for Christmas one year, and she would take me out back um, in the backyard and, and play t-ball with me, but there were, of course, only two of us, so she like improv the rules a little bit and and uh but it was always fun i mean she was always a, a wonderful a wonderful mom but it was you know it was a quiet house because it was just the two of us and um we would just have a lot of fun together and i had met my dad a couple times uh but they weren't married and, and had never been married and uh you know i don't have a ton of memories about meeting him early in life but i do remember asking my mom frequently about my dad when I was very young. And, and uh, she always came back with the same answer. She would just say, you know, your dad loves you very much, but he doesn't know how to be a dad right now. And uh, that was fine for me. Uh, that was an acceptable answer for, for the time being. And uh, But as I got older, I started to notice that, I mean, obviously, statistically, this isn't true, but it seemed like everybody had a mom and a dad, or at least a mom and a stepdad, or mom and mom's boyfriend, or whatever. I was starting to feel a lot like uh, very odd or very different, so I kept asking more and more about him. And I also noticed it felt like I was the only the only kid uh, without any siblings. You know, I, I always asked my mom, like, are you ever going to have... Uh, siblings for me and she said like we have to date someone at least for that and you know she was single my my entire life um so one day my grandma ran into my my dad at a uh department store and he basically said like oh i've been i've been looking to get a hold of them and everything and um you know this is obviously but my mom always had an unlisted phone number in the phone book and this is obviously before just looking someone up on facebook you know and uh, so my grandma put him in contact with my mom, and uh, there had never been, like, bad blood between them. There was just kind of lost touch or whatever. And and so she basically said, look, like, if you're going to be a part of his life, that's fine, but you've got to be there. you got to be consistent, and if you say you're going to pick him up, you pick him up. And if you say you're going to be at a birthday party, you come to the birthday party, and, you know, and he agreed. And so the next day she told me that she talked to him. And we set up a time to go meet and we went out and uh, we went to a bowling alley. And so I learned that not only was my dad coming back into my life, but that he and his wife were pregnant with my sister. So, you know, it was like I was getting this whole new family and this whole like new sense of normalcy, you know. And, and uh, so I was really excited. And then about a year later, my my brother was born. Uh, so I had two siblings and um and all that. And so over the course of that year, uh, I had started staying over there then, you know, stay in the night sometimes. And mainly it was just like, if, if my mom was, you know, out of town or something, um, I'd go stay there. And then that slowly turned into, you know, every other weekend, which so many children of separated parents, uh, experience. So every other weekend I'd go there and, um, he had this paper route that he would do. And it was delivering the Cincinnati Enquirer, and it was seven days a week, and never got a day off, even on holidays. And basically at one in the morning, he'd wake up and he'd go to the warehouse and he'd assemble these papers and stuff them all into bags and then take them on this big cart out and load up his his silver Dodge Caravan or whatever it was, floor to ceiling, and and then we would uh, he, he'd go deliver the papers, and and on the weekends I was there I'd go with him and help him. 
Uh, and it was always like, you know, it sucked waking up, but uh, the actual part was fun because we'd get there and, and after the assembly of all the papers, um, we'd get in the car and we'd listen to 90s country music. Um, and I didn't really care about country music, but I liked that music. And we'd always stop at the same BP station and he'd get himself a coffee and he'd get me a French vanilla cappuccino. And he'd let me throw the papers out the window at certain stops and you know, what kid doesn't love that? What adult wouldn't love throwing right, stuff totally. out of the vehicle? But, yeah. <laughs> but especially as a kid, that, I thought that was great. You know, it was this whole routine. And when we got back to his house, it was usually about five or six in the morning, and the rest of the house would still be asleep. And during this time, uh, he he turned the routine more sinister because he started showing me pornography and then sexually abusing me at that time. And... Um, when I tell my story, I like to interject here and just just point out that I was a a very educated kid about these kinds of topics. Um, you know, my mom had gotten me books that were appropriate for adolescents to understand sexuality and to understand anatomy, and they they had sections on sexual abuse and on harassment and on rape. I mean, I knew what these things were, but I just didn't recognize my own situation, you know, for what it was because these books. They didn't warn you about your parent, you know, and even if they had, like what kid should have to worry about, I mean, we know there's far too many, but what kid should have to worry about a parent anyway? Um, That's the safest place, the safest person. Right. I mean, I was at my second home, you know? So after about three years, I couldn't put a name on what was happening, but I knew that it had escalated to a point that I no longer wanted to go. Um, And so I was... um, walking home from school on a Friday on one of the Fridays that I was supposed to be going to his house. And I was walking to my best friend's house at the time. And, um, my mom had told me that when I got there to give my dad a call and arrange how I was getting over there. And then she'd pick me up and either take me home for him to pick me up or drop me off or whatever. So on the way to his house, I remember telling my friend like, Hey, you know, I'm supposed to call my dad. Don't let me call him. Um, And I kind of told him why. I told him what had been happening. And, and, you know, this is a kid who's also in eighth grade. Like, what? how's he supposed to handle that? You know, what's he supposed to do? And so we got to his house, and and we did whatever we played or whatever we did. And then my mom showed up. Uh, I had not called. She asked if I had called. And I said, no, and I'll tell you why in the car. You know, she was friends with my friend's mom. They talked for a minute, and then we, we went to the car. And, uh, she said, so why don't you want to go to your dad's or why didn't you call your dad's? And I said, I don't want to go over there anymore because, uh, he's been showing me pornography and touching me. And she said, you mean he's been sexually abusing you? And, uh, it was at that time that I, I recognized what I had been experiencing. And I remembered, you know, hearing that word and, and I guess it just kind of all clicked for me. From there, I mean, she, she cried and I cried and she told me I didn't have to go there anymore. And she told me she loved me and, She told me that it wasn't my fault and um, that she was proud of me for telling her and uh, and all this. And I like to describe my mom as Mrs. Claus. Um, She's about four foot ten and uh, she's she's dropped some weight. But at that time, she was probably about as round as she was tall (laughs) and uh, just love loving to everybody. Everyone's invited over. She literally was Mrs. Claus. Uh, She. She loves Christmas, and a lot of people associate my mom with Christmas, even before knowing all that. And um, at this time, I saw a side of her that I just hadn't seen before that, of course, a mother has, you know. But she basically called my dad and said, my son will not be coming over because you've been choosing to have sex with him. And you have 24 hours to decide whether or not you tell your wife or I tell your wife. Um, and I'm going to put them in counseling and they're going to need to file a police report. So I'll see you in court. And, uh, I don't give him credit for much, obviously, but what I will say for him is that he didn't try to deny it or fight it. He just, you know, he admitted everything. And we hear so many stories of people who, who do, you know, the exact opposite and try to run or try to get away from it, try to deny it, whatever. He didn't do any of that. So we did go through a court case. And I just remember, you know, during that time, you know, such a crucial time for a kid. I was, I was going into the summer after eighth grade 
And I was also starting a new high school after that. And I just think about like the lengths my mom went through to make sure that I had support. Um, she made sure I had positive male role models in my life that spent time with me. Uh, she made sure not a single day passed without me knowing how proud of me she was and just made sure that I knew how supported I was. And uh, because of how she responded and because of how she made sure other people responded, I've just never been been too you know ashamed of telling my story or anything. Uh, I've always recognized that it was uh, something that wasn't my fault. And so I would talk about my story in, in high school and in college. And, and, you know, people started telling me their stories about similar experiences that they'd had. And uh, oftentimes they would then follow up and say, but, but you're the first person I've ever told. I didn't know who to tell. Or they might say, I tried to tell my mom, but she didn't believe me. Or I, I tried to, you know, I tried to bring it up, but I didn't have the support that you were fortunate enough to receive. And after a while, I mean, that started to really weigh, weigh pretty heavily on me. Like I didn't know much about agencies or, or crisis centers or anything like that at the time. I was just like, why, uh, why isn't anyone reaching out to people who've been hurt by this? I come from a musical background. I was playing in bands and, and everything. And I remember being at, um, Cornerstone Music Festival, which doesn't exist anymore, and uh, it's—I think it's called Audio Feed now. But I remember being out there, and it was right before the band The Almost played, and a guy named Jamie came out on stage and talked a little bit about how people could find help if they'd been experiencing, you know, depression or anxiety or suicidal thoughts and stuff like that. And I had no idea who he or his company was at the time, but it turned out it was Jamie Tworkowski from mm, Twilight Love on Her Arms. Love that guy. Yeah, he's wonderful. And and I was like, gosh, like, why isn't anybody doing that but for sex abuse and yeah. for rape? And uh, gosh, it, it was 2008, 2009 at that time. And I, I was like, that'd be cool to do, you know. Uh, but I was still playing in bands and thought I had a bright future of music in front of me. <laughs> and... Um, I guess I just hadn't learned yet that <laughs> very few people get a career in music. But um, but I went home and I, I was like, well, I, I want to do something. And so I, I had the idea for A Voice for the Innocent, and I wanted it to be a place where people could come online and anonymously share stories with each other and, and support each other through that and things like that. So 2009, I created a Twitter account and a MySpace page. And that was it. And I made some really, really, you know, shitty images of, you know, stock images that I found of a, a broken heart. And I wrote a voice for the innocent on it was the worst thing. I knew nothing about branding. I knew nothing about graphic design. I, I still really don't, but I, you know, I at least recognize that I don't now. Um, and that was it. That's all I had then. I, and I didn't do anything with it because I didn't know how, I didn't know how to build a website. I didn't even know how to go about that. And so I just, let that idea sit in my brain and scratch my mind uh, every day until about three years later when I, I met a guy named Eric through a mutual friend that we were playing in a, a band together and, and Eric was, was this person's best friend and I met Eric. And I don't know what prompted me to do this. Um, basically, he, I was moving at the time and I wanted a shed for my backyard and he had a truck and I said, hey, you got a truck. And I had only met him like two or three times. And I said like, Hey, do you want to come, uh, help me tear down this shed and then bring it to this house and rebuild it? And for some reason he said, yes. And then I said, okay, so I'm also starting a nonprofit. Do you want to build a website for it? And he, for some reason, again, said, yes, he was a web developer was his, was his trade. So I was like, uh, and I had no idea the commitment I was asking him, but he, he stuck around and he, you know, we started going through, okay, what do you want someone to experience when they visit the site? What colors do you want them to see? Well, and I was like, I don't know, like, <laughs> just build a site, you know, and, and he really took me through all these ideas and everything about, about what, about usability and about branding and about all these different kinds of things that, that I hadn't thought of, but it really was so crucial because it gave us about a year to really dive in. Um, I always think it's kind of funny to look at our Twitter page because it says, that Twitter account's been active since 2009, but we didn't technically launch until 2012 um, mm. because there's that huge gap in there. That, you know, right, it just sat know. dormant for a few years. Right. 
So Eric is still our uh, our vice president. I work very closely with him. And, you know, we, we did launch exactly the site that I wanted. It, it was a place where someone could come. They weren't asked a ton of questions about who they are, so they could come and, and all they need to sign up on our site is an email address, which obviously you can go create, you know, a fake one at Gmail. That's fine for us. It's just enough to uh, prove you're a real person. And then from there, you create your own username, create your own password, and then and then you're in. And, uh, you know, people can share their stories. Um of sexual violence. Sometimes they've never told anybody. Sometimes they've told everybody and they just want to remind people that they can get through it. Um, and sometimes they've told people before and have had a negative experience. And so they're tr- testing the waters a little bit again. And then now there are people, you know, who are there to respond. And, and some of them are trained volunteers. Some of them are other storytellers. And, um, you know, when we first start, launched the site, we were like, well, how do we let people know about it? So we turned back to the exact music community where, where I had come from. And we started setting up shows that if my band had been together, maybe we would have played. And set up there and started telling people. And then that turned into like, well, hey, there's a comic convention. Maybe we could get a table there. And, and hey, let, why don't we go down to, to Pride and set up and march in the parade and then have a, have a booth at the festival. And so events really started to make sense for us because... We wanted to reach people where they were. I mean, I, I still kind of believe, I actually work now at an agency at a women's crisis center. And I love my work. I love my job and everyone that works there. But for agencies like the one I work at, I think outreach is lacking. Um, and sometimes it's due to staff or funding shortages that they just don't have. But there aren't people that are just out at events in the community saying, hey, this issue affects one in three women, one in six men. And if that's you or someone you know, you got a place. And here's our here's our postcard with our website and and then we can connect you to resources in your own neighborhoods and communities if you want that so outreach should be like everything right for right. for yeah, something I mean, like this because it's so hard for people to talk about right. outreach should be like a big part of the budget and a big part of the staffing for anything both what jamie and the to write love on our arms crew is doing what you're doing because it takes people so there are so many barriers between what's happening to them and them talking about it. And even right now with all this stuff that's happening with Harvey Weinstein and the Bill O'Reilly stuff and, you know, $32 million settlements from Fox, like there's so much fucked upness with this whole thing. And I get so livid. Like I just want to start punching walls or punch people in the throat when I see them write things like, well, why'd you wait till now to come out with it? Why'd you wait till now to talk about it? And I'm like, you do not even understand what it takes the 50, 75 barriers that are in place from whether it's psychological or physical or emotional barriers that are in place between like something happening like that to you and you actually talking about it. There's so many things at play that just prevent people from actually ever getting there. So that's just interesting to me that you would bring that up, that being such a lacking thing. It's, it's so true. What do you think needs to happen for that to for organizations like the one you're working with, you, you you commended them for so many great things, but for all the organizations working in this space, like what needs to happen for that to shift? I think a couple things. Um, one, I just don't think the one agency is not going to solve everything. Do you know what I mean? And so I think that it's important for people that work for these agencies to focus on their strengths. So my agency does have a shelter where where women can come who are – you know, escaping abusive relationships. Uh, we're actually a dual agency. So a lot of agency, my agency is technically in Kentucky, um, even though I live in Ohio. So, you know, and I don't know exactly how it works in every state, but in Kentucky, um, there's two like coalitions at the state level. And one of them focuses on sexual assault. One of them focuses on domestic violence and most shelters in the state or most agencies focus on one or the other. Um, and the one I work for actually focuses on both. So, Women who have been in domestic violence situations or have been sexually assaulted need a place to stay or something like that. We do have a shelter and there's a lot, you know, there's counselors available, there's court advocacy, there's hospital advocacy, and we do all that stuff really well. And I do want to mention, we're called Women's Crisis Center. I think most of the people that come through are women. However, we do we do help men as well. Uh, men who need to leave abusive relationships, men who have been sexually assaulted. Uh, we don't have a shelter for men, but I know that there is a program in place where we can put them up in a hotel. Um, That's cool. Yeah, it's, it's a neat, um, despite the name Women's Crisis Center, it's a really, really progressive understanding. You know, I think Women's Crisis Center, the name kind of turns some people off. Um, but I guess that's a different discussion for another time. 
And then we also do public education. And that's, that's actually my job is going into high schools and talking about preventing violence with a program called Green Dot. So with that said, like Green Dot's a research-based award-winning program. And I don't know that that could kind of be our form of outreach as we're in high schools, you know, but those are really substantial strengths of the agency I work for. So that for them to then pull attention away from that in order to go set up at the same places as someone like a voice for the innocent would, or to write love on her arms, or it just doesn't seem to make sense. So my, my thing is, I think that I just think agencies shouldn't try to do it all just like our strengths. We are not a crisis agency. You know, we partnered with the crisis text line um, for people because we, we do occasionally, sometimes we'll mess, someone will message our social media at two in the morning, struggling, really having a hard time with something. And we have the automatic message that pops up and says, look, you know, we're not always on Facebook. Here's a place where you can reach our partner. And it's simple. You shoot a text out and you're connected with a counselor. You know, you text the word voice to 741741. You're connected with a counselor. Um, it's free and it's anonymous. And um, so that's a, that's a thing for us. But we knew that wasn't our strength. So we, we found a way to, you know, bridge that gap. And then that's it. We didn't try to focus on too much. I think the other thing that people can do on a, on a personal level is um, you mentioned before people saying, you know, oh, why did these women wait so long to come forward? Or, you know, and, and you, I think the biggest one we saw that about re- in recent news was Bill Cosby. And people are saying, why, why do people wait so long? So my problem with that is, one, our opinion on that matter, we're not on the jury. We're not a judge. So our opinion on it really doesn't matter. Like, we're just voicing it to voice it. But what it's actually doing is, so if I go on Facebook and I say, why do these women wait so long to come forward? To any woman who's in my life who sees that and, and thinks, oh, gosh, it's been five years for me. Yep. I can't talk to him. Yep. You know what I mean? And a lot of times, I think that the people that post this just aren't thinking about it in that light. They're not considering that, you know? They're really trying to say, oh, you know, I don't know what they're trying to say. I'm not even trying to defend that. I just think that by criticizing the actions of other survivors who are coming forward, you are damning the ones in your own life. You're, you're blocking yourself off as a resource. You know what I mean? As somebody who can help. And I think most people wouldn't want that. So I just think that it's important for us to, if we're going to say something publicly about sexual violence or about sexual violence survivors, there's just no point in saying anything but, but anything supportive. Otherwise, it's just not helping the cause. It's building more barriers. Um, another thing, we, we give a lot of uh, talks and classes on what we call the importance of the first response. And, you know, we break it down to if somebody's telling us about sexual violence they, they've they experienced, we break it down to listen, believe, and validate. Because when we were launching, we wanted volunteers and so many people were like, I don't know. I just fear that I'd say the wrong thing. I've never been assaulted. I wouldn't know what to say. And, you know, I'm not saying it's easy, but the steps are simple, you know. And if we remember, like, when we're listening, we don't have to ask questions. Actually, it's better if we don't, especially why questions. And I think it's easy to overlook that because when we're thinking about like, okay, let's say we've got a loved one, a best friend, they go to a party, they get assaulted, and they're confiding in us and telling us what happened. We are hurting with them, right? Maybe not to the degree they are, but we're affected by that. We don't want that to have happened to them. And God, like, why'd you even go to that party? God, it was such a simple question to ask. And I definitely think there are people who try to victim blame with with malicious intent. I also think there are just some people who don't think about what they're saying. And every single why question that you're going to ask, the person who was directly assaulted has already asked that a million times. And you're essentially validating where they're placing that blame. So we just say, just don't ask questions. Yeah, you're talking about empathy here. You're talking about some people have it naturally, have lots of it naturally, a little bit naturally. I think all of us have it, right? It's there. It just needs to be developed, man. We are not empathetic people for the most part. Like you said, we ask the why questions, which have no bearing whatsoever. Maybe there's some that need to be asked at some point, but at that moment, listen just right, just, just listen. sit in the moment hear what they have to say let them in an unbridled unrestrained way talk about what just happened to them which was totally terrible um we're so 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 bad at that yeah we think that we have to have something profound to say right. back you know 
that's not a fault of people, but I think it's a misconception. We ran this uh, this program. Um, it was just a little project we did called Hope Notes. We still do them at some of our events, but they're basically we'd have a big sheet of paper out, and and it was almost a take a penny, leave a penny, but for a, a hopeful note. And it wasn't it was an extension of what we did. It wasn't just for sexual assault survivors, but it was for literally anyone. And then we also had a big suitcase that the Hope Notes would go in. So you could walk by and you could take a note. You could walk by and you could leave a note or you could do both. And uh, people, especially at bigger events, love them. Some people want to come grab them and pass them out and and that's cool with us or whatever. So we have all these notes of encouragement and we would get people that come up and they'd say, I really want to write one, but I don't know what to write, you know. And we'd say like, look, you know, a lot of times we'd be at music festivals and we'd say, look, you can think of your favorite song lyrics that get you through the bad day. Or you can think of some movie quote that helps you, you know. Um, or you could just literally say something super, super generic and say, that thing you're going through, you're going to crush it, you know. And so some people would be like, okay. So they would, they would do that. And uh, we've had people come by our table and just grab a hope note, and they literally will start crying. Not everybody, of course, but, but the, it's happened on a number of occasions where people start crying and they think, oh, my God, I needed to hear this. And it's never the profound notes that do that, right? It's, it's always the ones that say everything's going to work out. Something super, almost cliche, you know, but it's the simple things that can apply. So, so when, when we're dealing with somebody who's, who's experienced sexual violence, rather than coming up with some profound way that they will move past this in the next six months or whatever, simply saying, I'm so sorry, and, and this wasn't your fault. Like, that can go so much further. And a lot of times, that's all somebody wants to hear anyway. You know what I mean? Like, when it really comes down to it, they want to know, like, I'm not, you know, crazy for making this up. I, I or not making this up. I'm not making this up. I'm not crazy. You know, I experienced this, and it hurts. And, and for somebody to say, like, yeah, you know, you're right – that can be it, you know, that can be all. And, and for somebody to know that, that you're in their corner, that, for, you know, for, for them to say, I'm here for you if you need anything, I think that that goes so much further than writing some soliloquy, yep, you know? Yep, no, that's super helpful. So here's a question I, I'd love to ask. Why do you do this? Why do you give a damn? I mean, we've talked about the what and the, the how and all of those things. And it can't just be, in my mind, maybe it is. And if it is, that's fine. I'm not trying to like downplay that. It can't just be like, oh, because I went through it and I don't want more people to go through it because there's a lot of people, like so many people have been sexually abused and they don't ever do what you're doing with it, right? They're not creating this platform and this family and this community. So maybe it's just that, but like, what's the why behind what you're doing? Well, I think for a lot of times uh, when people do this stuff, there is uh, a little bit of selfishness in it. We, we help others because it feels good, mm-hmm. right? Like yeah. We, yeah. we want that. We want that sense of knowing that we, we help someone, and especially if it's, a, if it's a hard spot we can connect to. Now, when I first thought about this, I mean, it, it was very much a thing that was like, okay, I went through this, and a lot of people have told me that – just on a personal level, I'd, I'd helped them deal with it. So why can't I make this bigger? I mean, it, there was a sense of, of wanting to create the same community that my mom built for me. But, you know, I think it's also, it was a new challenge. You know, it was, um, I had been playing music for so long, and this was a way that I could help that, that community that, you know, I grew up in the music community, you know. So it was a way to reach out to, to the same community I'd loved for so long. It was neat to tackle these these problems um, on a like business level of like oh gosh like what paperwork do we file I mean like all of that was was interesting to do but when we first started and then I started hearing hearing stories of how we how we help people or just knowing that there was a place for them to go um, and then hearing people saying that me telling my story impacted them like even if they didn't share their story on the site we still get messages there's a um, a true crime podcast called Sword and Scale, and it's it's huge. I mean, it's it, it's in the like last I looked, it's in like iTunes top fifty, you know, and it's the top true crime podcast. And when it was very very small, I guess not very very small, but when it was much smaller than it is now, I was I was shared my story on one of the episodes. I mean, I still at least two or three times a month get somebody emailing or writing us on Facebook saying, like, I just heard your episode on Sword and Scale. It really spoke to me. Like, how many people aren't messaging us? You know. And so knowing that like just telling my story has somehow helped somebody else with one more day in their journey, um, 
I realized that this organization has helped me more than I ever expected that I needed or would help me. I, I think that I was in a spot where, you know, I was like, okay, I'm 20, 25, 26. I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I've quote unquote gotten over my story or whatever. I'm in a spot where I can help people. And I think maybe I was in a good spot to start, but, but helping other people through their stories helps me continue to heal. And it humbles me, and it and it gives me a sense of of purpose. You know, I worked a lot of um, retail jobs and serving jobs. I'm a firm believer that all work is noble, and I needed those jobs. And um, I'm certainly no better than those jobs now, but it wasn't fulfilling any kind of sense of of purpose for me. You know what I mean? And and a lot of, a lot of that was met through writing lyrics that I felt were meaningful and playing music and all that. But now that that's not something I'm doing as much. I mean, it's, this gives me a sense of, of purpose. It gives me a sense of, you know, working against, against something and taking a stand on something. I love that. So I want to give more dams. The people listening want to give more dams. That's why we invited you on, you know, the podcast, share your story. What advice can you give us? Right? So everybody has their unique narrative and story, your unique journey through life, the things that have happened to you, the things that have happened for you. So, Based on all the things you've learned, the things that you're going through even right now in your present life and the, in your leadership and, and all of those things, what advice could you give us to help us get further down the road of giving more dams, helping more people, serving more people, loving more people? Give us two or three that are right at the forefront of your, your mind or at the tip of your tongue, just things that you really live by and are really helped by, things that you've learned. Sure. So the big two that pop up for me, the, fir- the first one is that I don't really think that any of us have gotten anywhere alone. You know what I mean? Um, and I suppose somebody could probably come up with a scenario where I'd be wrong. I'm, I'm wrong all the time. So that's probably... But by and large. Yeah, I mean, we, we rely on the support from others, you know. And, and if I'm constantly taking that support or that help or, or whatever that is, that sense of community, but I'm never giving it back, I don't want to say that's selfish. Everyone's... Conti- everyone's situations are different. But I think that if we have a chance to help other people, we just should, even if it's with something that doesn't make much sense to us. I think that, like I said, we, we know, none of us got any where we are alone. We've had to rely on the support of other people. That's l- the literal sense of the word community and, and is supporting other people and being with other people and, and walking together, essentially. I think the other thing, too, that I realized so much uh, – recently is, you know, I, I work, like I said, teaching a violence prevention program in schools. And uh, it was getting to be the end of the summer this year. And I was just feeling really frustrated with a lot of things. I don't remember what sexual assault case was in the news, but I'm, I'm sure there was one, which had been followed by another one and then another one. And just the political divide in our country, things have just felt heavy, you know, for, for, people doing the work that I do. And I was frustrated with so many different little aspects of um, my work. And I was feeling like a lot of my schools weren't either communicating or cooperating with me. And I'm sitting here thinking like, look, you're getting this violence prevention program. It's a really, really good one. And you're getting it for free, yet you don't want to give me the access I need to implement it properly. And, it, it, you know, schools have their own things to work through also. But at the time, it was just very frustrating. And watching people tear each other apart online, and I just was starting to feel like, you know what? Nobody cares. Nobody cares if anything's any better. Let's just, you know, watch the world burn and uh, and fuck it. You know what I mean? I don't want to do this. Um, Then I, you know, I still have to pay my bills. And So I went to work and I had to go into one of my schools and it was like the first time that I'd really been there. And I went up to lunch and I, and I just want to, um, you know, this is a, a school, it's an inner city school that I work in and it's very low income and students are faced with challenges that I've never had to go through both economically, racially, you know, in every way, just experiences I've never had simply because because I'm white, because I'm male, like, you know what I mean? There are just so many different situations for different people. And these high school students that I'd trained in previous years and gotten to know in previous years, the, the program I teach is called Green Dot. So they started individually coming up to me and they'd be like, hey, when's Green Dot meeting? And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't have anything planned yet. And they're like, okay, well, make sure to let me know. And I was like, okay. 
And this happened probably a dozen times the first day that I was there. And I was sitting, I was just thinking like, you know, they see, they see the same world that I see. They see the same messes that I see yet. They're coming to me saying, all right, we got to get to work basically, you know, like we got to still work to do. And then I, um, got a message on, on Reddit of all places of, uh, somebody had been asking in a subreddit what they had experienced was essentially worthy of them going to get help for it, you know, and, and it was a support group kind of thing they wanted to do. And, and she was saying, I feel like my story's not worth going in there. I feel like I'm going to a meeting where everyone's meeting about their broken leg, but I've just stubbed my toe, you know? And I was like, I basically talked to her and was like, look, like you, you still got to heal from that. Even if you view it as a stubbed toe, it's affecting the way you walk. Like you got to, you still deserve help. You still can get through that. And I just gave, you know, kind of, um, I mean, I think it was heartfelt, but it, it was a pretty basic message about you definitely deserve that. Well, she messaged me on Reddit. Um, I didn't know this person and she messaged me a week or two later and she was like, I just want to let you know that what you said encouraged me to go and I had a really good time and I'm looking forward to going back. And I realized that through my students at the school and and through messages like that and through the tiny little comments that I often overlook on our site that say like, thank you, this site's really helped me. Through all those little tiny things, it is so immensely important to celebrate small victories. And I had to remind myself of that and kind of relearn that because, you know, when we're thinking about like, you know, oh gosh, we're taking on a literal whole political infrastructure that is suppressing women and, and minorities. And God, what does it even matter if I'm working in this school? Because people can't stop cussing each other out and being, you know, racist and sexist on on Facebook or whatever. You know, when I focus on taking all that on, it can feel really, really bleak, but I can still make differences in my corner of the world. And if I'm not celebrating small victories, then there's nothing there's nothing left to focus on because the big problems are too big for one person. When I was a kid, I remember hearing this story that I had to kind of re, that I'm glad I remembered it recently. And, and maybe you or your, any of your listeners have heard it, but basically a, an old man walks onto a beach and it's covered for as far as he can see with starfish that have been washed up. And there was a little kid and he was picking them up individually and throwing them back into the ocean. And the old man went up to him and the kid's like hard at work and he's throwing it in. And the old man said, what are you doing? And the kid said, I'm throwing these starfish back in the water. And the old man kind of snickered and he said like, you know, son, there are far too many out here. There's just one of you. What difference can you possibly make? And he picked up another one and he threw it in the water. And he said, I made a huge difference to that one, sir. Wow. And I just love that story because, sure, the kid can't clean the whole beach, but maybe the kid can throw one starfish back in, you know. And I think that's so important. Celebrating small victories, you know, we, we absolutely have to. We have to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's part of why I'm doing what I'm doing with championing, you know, you and so many others and the stories you're telling is because I think that's what bogs us down so many times is like, oh, this is too big. My contribution is not going to make that much of a difference, so I'm not going to do it at all. When if everybody stops saying that and actually did something about it, the contribution would be huge altogether, right? Like if, in other words, if that old man would have stopped discouraging the boy and picked up a few starfish himself, right. you know what I'm saying? Like that double the impact just right away with one less naysayer and one more helper. Brandon Harvey, the Sounds Good podcast, is always talking about look for the helpers, which is the Mr. Rogers mm -hmm. thing. Like oh, yeah. there's always helpers out there and we just have to be one of them and look for more of them to link arms with. I love what you're saying there. Before we get to the last question, where can people go find out more about you and the work you're doing, website, social media, handle all of that stuff? Yeah, so... Um a Voice for the Innocent is just avfti.org. You know, if you're listening and you've been impacted by sexual violence and, and you feel like nobody's really heard you or, or you've never told anyone or you've not been believed, or even if you feel like you've experienced sexual violence, but it's not a big enough story to tell, I assure you that that's, you know, that's not true on our site. You're welcome there and there, we're waiting to, to hear from you. So avfti.org. Um, also more, we do more like commentary, writing of articles, uh, positive kind of stuff on, um, on our social media, which, uh, just a voice for the innocent on Facebook, uh, AVFTI on Twitter and Instagram. My personal Twitter is just Jamie Syvers, J-A-M-I-E-S-I-V-R-A-I-S. -I 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 and I just usually, uh, either talk about football or Ninja Turtles. So <laughs> 
That's all the socials. So all you football and Ninja Turtle fans out there, uh, go follow Jamie. No, that's great. Thanks for sharing those. Last question, hypothetical. The not hypothetical part is that you're going to die someday. The hypothetical part is that some, for some reason I'm giving your eulogy and all of your friends and your, your family, uh, your fans, the people that you have affected through your work at uh, A Voice for the Innocent, all the, the, the programs you've done in the schools, everybody's there. They're all there to yeah, just celebrate and mourn your life, right? And I, I get to give your eulogy. Um, what do you hope that I'll say on that day about your, your life and legacy? My wife asked me one time, if you could be remembered for one thing, what would it be? Uh, and I said, a helper. And she said, that's what I want to be remembered for. So I, I would love it if it, you know, and it kind of goes, it ties in with the, the Mr. Rogers thing. I, I want to be remembered as a helper. I also, um, I'm actually looking at a, a poster right now because it's it was so impactful for me. The very first hardcore band I ever listened to was a band called Refused. And uh, they have a song and the chorus has been one that's literally like guided me. And, and they just say, I'd rather be forgotten than remembered for giving in. So, um, mm, wow. Yeah. I love that quote. I love it so much. Uh, and so throw that somewhere in your eulogy. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Helper in the hardcore music chorus lyrics. Yeah. I'd rather be forgotten than remembered for giving in. I love it. Well, Jamie, this has been, uh, enlightening, helpful. I've learned a ton. I know that with the amount of people that listen to this podcast, there are so many that have been sexually abused, whether that's accidental touching all the way through rape and so on and so forth. And so I'm hoping that they have found some help and solace and just some steps forward for those that haven't talked about it or don't talk about it a lot. So thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you for giving your life to this cause and these causes to help people uh, through this way. You're, you're an inspiration to us all. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you so much. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure to be here. Awesome. We'll talk soon, Jamie. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you all for joining Jamie and me for Chapter 37 of the Let's Give a Damn podcast. What a compelling, hard to hear, but need to hear kind of story, right? Uh, I'm so grateful for the ways in which Jamie has embraced the pain that he's experienced and felt, and he's turning that into love and action and care and service toward others and for others. So go check out Jamie Cyrus all over social media. That's Jamie, S-I-V-R-A-I-S, Jamie Cyrus. You can also follow A Voice for the Innocent at A-V-F-T-I, at A-V-F-T-I on Twitter. Go check out what they're doing. And then you can follow the work that they're doing at a voice for the innocence.org. And if you are a victim of sexual abuse and something you haven't been able to talk about and that you've been traumatized and hurt, and that's probably everybody in some way that has been sexually abused, in some more than others, I would love for you to go check out a voice for the innocent.org. Go check out what Jamie and the team are doing. Hit him up on Twitter, hit them up on Twitter. And I know that they want to help. They want to serve you. They want to love you. They want to care for you. And they've created resources to do just that. Thank you for joining me. A couple quick housekeeping things. As we near the end of the year, I would love for you to participate in little ways to help us get the word out there about our podcast. As we always, there are a few different ways you can do that. One of them is by taking a screenshot. If you listen to this on your phone, take a screenshot of you listening, share it on social media. I always have stories of people that heard about the podcast through somebody else sharing that in their Instagram story or on their Instagram or on Twitter. And so please do that. That actually helps a lot. Another way you can do it is by leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That also helps. In a way, it gives us legitimacy the more reviews there are there, but I, I don't want you to give a bullshit review, give an honest review, but uh, please aim to make that a five-star one. That would help us a ton. And then lastly, you can help by donating a few dollars a month on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash let's give a damn. That's a platform that helps makers and creators raise money from fans and friends of the project of the artist of the creator and you can do that uh, right now one dollar five dollars ten dollars twenty five dollars a month whatever suits you 
we'd love for you to participate that way. That helps us pay for travel to go do interviews, production costs, so on and so forth. None of it goes directly into my pocket at all. It goes right back into the work of creating this podcast. Thank you so much. This is an amazing month, November. Usually people think of Thanksgiving. So much to be thankful for. As we near Thanksgiving time, when we will get together with family and friends and strangers alike to share the blessings that we've had this year, share the ups, share the downs, and express our gratitude during that time. Let's not rush too quickly into the day after, the Black Friday, right after Thanksgiving, when people begin to turn into gimme monsters, uh, like my four and three and five-year-old spend most of their time being that right now. Let's not be that. Let's figure out how in this month we can become grateful people, a people that will not be consumed by things and by stuff. Let's turn into people that will be consumed with how can we love people and serve people during this time, this season of the year. I love you all very much. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for always being here. Thank you for sharing. I love sharing these stories with you and I hope, I really, really hope that they are hitting you somewhere important in your life, that they are affecting your life and that they are turning you into an action-oriented person, someone that wants to go out and physically give a damn about some people, something that needs your help, that needs your skills, that needs your love. So go out and do that. I love you all very much. Talk to you very soon. Bye.